Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you're watching my walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for Nintendo Wii U and Switch. In the last several videos, we completed the Great Plateau and got the Paraglider, so we're now finally ready to leave the Great Plateau at long last. Now our next objective is to head towards Kakariko, however there is several things we can do that are quite useful. In particular, one of the things I'd recommend you do before anything else is get some weapons, and that's actually really easy to do if you just warp to the Kainamut Shrine, which is the shrine that's up on Mount Hylia, the snowy area off to the far west of the Great Plateau. From here you can sail to the northwest, where there is actually a Hinox on top of this circular platform. From here you can just land on top of its chest and then just press in on the left analog stick to cause Link to sneak. And then from there you can then sneak over to the weapons that are around its neck and grab all of them. So just drop any weapons that you don't want and then pick up these ones that are right here. Now there's a soldier bow which is pretty decent for a bow at this stage and there's also a soldier spear. The soldier spear is okay. What we're really interested in is the moonlight scimitar which is kind of a mid-tier weapon. It's okay uh, as far as the general scheme of things but that is a significant upgrade for right now. That's a really good weapon and it's way more powerful than anything else we have right now, so it's a super good option. Now, if you fail at landing on the Hinox or it wakes up and you mess it up, then don't worry about it. You can totally just warp to the Kainamut Shrine and try again. Now, unfortunately, you can't always land on top of a Hinox's chest because there just isn't any high areas that you can warp to or that you can climb over to because they're just in a big flat area. So sometimes you have to come at it from ground level. And if you have to do that, one way to, to not wake them up but still get all their goodies is to simply sneak onto their hand. You see, their left hand will occasionally scratch their belly. So what you can do is you can just sneak onto it and just wait here and it will bring you up to its chest, which is great. Now, defaultly, this will actually, you'll, you'll bonk against the side of its chest and you'll land on the ground and the Hinox will be like, Whoop, and wake up and then it'll go back to sleep after a moment. So just, if it does that, just don't move, wait for it to go back to sleep and try again. Now, in order to land on its chest successfully, what you have to do is you have to move the analog stick right as the hand is at the top part of the arc. So when it's right here, quickly move and then stop moving again and then quickly duck down so you don't wake it up. And that's the trick. You can move for a split second on its chest, but you have to uh, like quickly switch to sneaking again. So that's the trick for getting on top of its chest. It might take a couple tries to get used to it, but it is very useful in that way you can steal all its goodies without waking it up. The final option for getting goodies is if the Hinox wakes up or if you wake it up on purpose, simply back up and shoot it in the eye with an arrow. This will stun it and while it's stunned, you can run forward and collect all the goodies around its neck and then just walk away because we don't actually have to kill the Hinox at all. In fact, there's not particularly a reason to kill this one because it doesn't, it, you know, lower tier monsters do not drop high tier treasure and the high tier treasure is significantly more rare. So this regular Hinox has a very low chance to drop Hinox guts, but meanwhile, a black Hinox has a much higher chance to drop it. So really, if we're gonna be fighting Hinox, we really wanna be killing black Hinox is really what we want to be killing. So, which we can't really afford to do that right now anyways. But just as a point, um, I don't recommend killing this guy because it's just not worth it. It's not worth our time, um, both as far as wasting our weapons as well as we're not gonna get the treasures that we're really after. So you can kill it if you want to, it's not really worth it. I would recommend you just steal all that stuff and run away. So for the early parts of the game especially, you're gonna to want to steal items from Hinox because they give you pretty high tier weapons for what they are. And just so you know, the weapons do scale with the game. So as you progress through the game, the weapons around their neck will get higher quality. So they start off at like soldier gear, um, after you've killed some, or after you've completed some of the Divine Beasts, then the items will upgrade for each Divine Beast you've completed. So next we're heading to the stables, just to the north, and there's a quest we're going to grab here in just a little bit, but anyways, right next to every stable in the game, there is a shrine, and it's, they're, they're super nice teleport points actually, so I'd highly recommend you grab these. So what I'm doing is I'm just climbing the hill just to the west of the stable itself, which is where the shrine that is related for the stable is located. So I'm just heading directly to the shrine for this location. But if, yeah, if the direction I'm traveling confuses you a little bit, just follow the road and you can totally see the shrine on the hillside from there. This is honestly one of the harder shrines in the game in my opinion. Honestly, it's quite confusing, but uh, welcome to Rota O. Or should I say Rota O? I don't know. <laughs> Do whatever you want. So shoot the arrow with an arrow. This will cause this platform to spin back and forth and we're gonna have to go to the other side and then shoot it again from that direction. So what this will do is it will spin it back the other way, and one of the things this accomplishes is it uncovers the water so we can actually see it very well. Now from, from this middle platform, what you can do is you can now see the surface of the water now that's rotated this direction, and you can use Cryonis on the surface to create blocks that you can then climb in order to reach this far alcove that has a chest containing a small key. Next, we need to go back to the middle of the area, and you can do this by either creating another Cryonis block, just like we just did, or you can swim through the water and take the long path. I actually jumped in the water and then realized that I was had already made a mistake, and I was like, whoops! Oh well, so I'm swimming the long way around. Once you get back to the middle, collect all the arrows along the way, and then open the locked door. 
All right, so now that we have a key, we can finally open the door right here, which will allow us to have a shortcut so we don't actually need the platform flipped any particular direction. But what this also does is it gains us access to this glowing orb. We want to go ahead and pick it up and throw it into the cradle of the platform over here. And then at this point, now you can shoot the arrow switch again. This will cause the orb to land inside of the uh, slot over here on the other side that we couldn't reach before. So. Now that that is activated, what this will do is it causes this nearby platform to continually fire up and will allow us to get to the upper portions of this platform. So the first thing you want to do is you want to open the chest straight ahead to simply sail to it using the paraglider, and this has a feathered edge. Now, generally speaking, I think this weapon is pretty bad. Like on a scale from 1 to 10, I'd give it like a solid 3. It's okay. It's not terrible, but it's not very good either. However, it is still better than some of the other weapons I have. Now, if you're unsure on the exact quality range, I have a chart on screen for various weapons so you can decide which ones you want to get rid of. Um, I'm going to show this chart kind of a lot early on, but then later in the walkthrough I probably won't show it at all very much unless I'm talking about the pros and cons of things. But I feel like early on especially there's so many new weapons to choose from that it can be kind of useful to be able to actually compare. Like it's just confusing like a one-hander or two-hander, you're not sure how they actually compare to each other. So after you've played this game for a while though, you will kind of recognize some of the uh, prefixes on the weapon titles and then that will tell you kind of the quality range. So next we need to activate the arrow switch, but we need to be down here on this platform. So you want to activate a bomb, and unfortunately I was standing too far on the edge. What you want to do is you want to stand really close to the wall so that it doesn't fling you, and I'm going to get back up there and show you what I mean. Real quick, I'm going to activate the arrow switch again, but I'm using bombs so that I don't like shoot it with more arrows that I need to collect. So I'm just going to use my bomb to activate it instead, and then I'm going to get back on top of the platform. So in my experience, there's two ways to do this. You want to lay down a bomb and then you want to stand either right here on this edge so that you can very quickly like walk over to the right or you want to stand down here. I think this is way easier to stand like in the corner and then walk towards the right as you activate the bomb and this way you won't fall down. So that's the trick for not falling down. And then once you get up to the top, watch out for this hole right here. I think a lot of people probably fall into that, but that's really sad if that happens to you. Anyways, that's the end of the shrine and hopefully you guys didn't have too much trouble with that. So two quick tips for completing this shrine as an alternative to using bombs. You can jump off that ledge and while still facing towards the arrow switch and then pull out your bow. When you use your bow in midair, it will cause time to slow down. It makes a, gives you a little bit more of a chance to aim and stuff. Uh, but anyways, you can do this in midair so that the platform doesn't immediately fling you down. Um, and then that way you will land in the correct place. So it's just another interesting trick you can use for this. Also, another thing you can do too is if you do get flung up, like I did the first time when it flung me down into the cradle, um, if instead you use the paraglider, you can sail off to the right as well. And that's another way of completing that shrine too. Um, so you, even if it does fling you, you can still work with it by using your paraglider and use it to your advantage. So those are just two quick tips for that shrine as well. Next up, we're going to go get a horse. Now there's a lot of horses in Hyrule and most of them are just honestly just absolute garbage. So <laughs> there is a quest you can get here at the outskirts stable which leads to horse gear which is a very nice thing and also the royal white, st white stallion from this quest is kind of a medium quality. It's okay. It's not bad but it's not great either but it's just kind of middle of the road which is for right now it is the fastest horse that is close. There are better horses in the game and we I will get some nice horses later but for this point in the game it's just pretty nice. I think Nintendo planned this. It's like they have this pretty easy to do horse quest right next to the Great Plateau so you can do it immediately as you leave. So I just I think it's, uh, it's just a really smart thing to do. You don't have to do it right now, but I think it makes the most sense to because we can use it for this next little while. So I would highly encourage you to get Korok seeds early on at least just to get some of the upgrades for because the earlier upgrades are really cheap. So if you just get, you know, 50, 70 something Korok seeds, it helps a lot um, early on. And then after that, you can kind of do whatever you want and just ignore them or whatever. One of the things I'm going to do for this walkthrough is I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in depth at first. And then I'm just basically going to skim over Koroks and I'm not even really going to talk about them. But I'd like to show one of each type. Like I've heard a lot of people say things like online like, oh, I didn't even know there was that type of Korok. I didn't, if I had known that, I would have kept an eye out for it. So my thought is I'm going to show a bunch of them in depth. So for example, here is a rock completion puzzle. The idea is you see a suspicious pattern on the ground, but one of the rocks is missing. So find a nearby rock, complete the pattern, and a Korok will appear. We had one of these puzzles up on the Great Plateau as well, but there is a ball and chain puzzle. You want to use magnesis on these objects to place them somewhere. In this case, it's the stump of the log that it's attached to. Um, these are pretty straightforward puzzles. Sometimes there is one ball connected to another ball at the other end of the chain, and those ones are a little bit harder to place. There's a couple tricky ones in this game, and I'll point those ones out in particular, but most of these I won't talk about moving forward just because they're all kind of the same thing. So occasionally you'll also see circles of rocks in the water, and these are always things that you need to use. Uh, you need to throw a rock into it. So we can't actually reach this one though because it's too far away. So the trick is you need to use Cryonis here to create some platforms so you can bounce the rocks off it. It's not really that big a deal, although I will say that a couple things about this. I think this upper platform is a lot harder. The, e the easier one by far is that lower platform. 
Another thing to know about rocks is that it is a little bit random because they're not like perfectly even and they they're just all these weird lopsided shapes and so as and you pick them up at different angles too and you can even like pick up a rock and pick it up again to change the angle that is currently being held in your hands uh, so that when it bounces it bounces like, at a different side of the rock so just weird things to be aware of weird mechanics of how rocks work uh, but anyways so they just know that they can bounce really wildly regardless of how straight you are so grab the Koroks if you wish, then continue following the road going across Manhala Bridge. After that, you want to climb Safula Hill, which is our destination, and at the top of which there's also another Korok in the form of these little statues that have little bowls in front of them containing apples. But one of the apples is missing, so throw an apple in it, and then this will complete the pattern which makes the Korok appear. So I get the feeling that Koroks, or at least the person who designed the Koroks, was really, really OCD. Because Koroks are always some kind of pattern, like there's a circle of rocks and you have to throw a rock into it. But just the circle of rock itself is a pattern, and so it's to draw your attention to it. I think that it was designed geared towards OCD people. So all you OCD players out there, you're just, you're just wandering around Hyrule, minding your own business, and you see some bowls, and one of them is missing an apple, and your left eye starts twitching. <laughs> so that's, that was Nintendo's goal all along, was just to make you go crazy. <laughs> I must. I must complete it. See, the non-OCD people don't care. They're like, yeah, it's, it's an optional side quest. The OCD people, meanwhile, are like, this is mandatory. This, you don't understand. <laughs> this is serious. So by the way, all those apple puzzles like that, the Koroks don't really care about the apples after you've completed it and made them appear. So if you if you want, you can totally just pick up all the apples after that from then on. Free food! So go ahead and grab those apples afterwards. And uh, moving on, there is a warm diner up ahead off to the right. I always forget to grab these guys. I just neglect them because I'm like, ah, eh, they're common, whatever. And then I just never end up with some. Um, I've been trying to pay attention to this walkthrough as this playthrough of where I see bugs. I'm trying to just be more observant of that. So I'm just commenting on the fact that there is some warm darners here. They're kind of a mid-tier ingredient for elixirs for cold resistance, which is kind of nice, actually. They're, they're nicer than the uh, summer wing butterflies. So we're going to grab one of those if you want to. Up ahead on the top of this hill right next to this tree, you want to save because just over this hill is where the white stallion is located. So anyway, the Royal Stallion is located here in between Safula Hill and the Sanadin Park ruins. And so right in between there. So what I recommend you do is save on top of the hill uh, for a couple reasons. Then I'll explain that here in a moment. The horse will just, if you load your game, it'll appear somewhere around here. So if you're too close, then you could just load your game and you'll pop up right next to it and then it'll spook it away. So if you're on top of the hill, meanwhile, you don't have to worry about that. Um, another thing to know is in order to tame this horse, you're going to need like a little bit over like one and a half stamina wheels is about what it takes. So you're going to need some stamina food this early in the game because we just don't have enough stamina defaultly to do this. So I did make a bunch of stamina meals on the Great Plateau earlier in previous videos. So that's why I have so many meals. So you're going to need some of those. If you don't have any yet, you're going to need some and I will be doing that in the next couple of videos. Now here what happened is I ran out of stamina, I quickly ate a meal, but I didn't d eat the next one fast enough, so I actually ran out of stamina, and that's why I got knocked off. Um, so I had to load is what ended up happening. It was just a mistake. I ate too small of a meal. I should have gotten something bigger or, or press start a little bit sooner. I was surprised at how fast that ran out. Regardless, that was a mistake, It was really, but it was actually really close. I almost had that horse tamed. So anyways, loaded my game. The other method of getting to the horse is to land on top of it. Now, this didn't really work out too well because I was facing the wrong direction. I should have waited until the horse stopped moving before I attempted this, but as you can see, it kind of messed it up. Now, if you do spook a horse, you can still sneak up on it, so I could either load my game at this point or just wait for the horse to calm down and then sneak up on it just like normal. Now, there is another way to capture horses, and that is just to be super aggressive. So you can either spook them in a particular direction on purpose and try to intercept them. So, for example, laying down a bomb and then detonating it and then chasing up to them in the direction that they flee. That doesn't really work super well because they flee away from you as well. So they're kind of like run away from the bomb and immediately turn around again. So you, you kind of run up to them while they're in the middle of turning is kind of the idea. And that's okay. It's a lot easier to just shoot them with an ice arrow, basically, and then freeze them and then just, just walk up to them and just mash A until the ice thaws out and you grab onto them. If it's a weak horse, that'll just kill it, obviously, but if it's a nicer horse, then it has enough health that it can handle that. So those are that's another method you can use as well, which we do actually have ice arrows at this point if you've been following along with me. One of the other things to comment on with the flying method, the problem with the flying method too is you use a lot of stamina just getting to the horse in the first place, so it's just kind of wasteful. You end up needing more stamina food just to to recoup that cost, I guess, once you arrive. Uh, but yeah, I would say, though, overall, the easiest way to get horses in general is actually to shoot them with an ice arrow. I know that sounds weird, but it's actually super useful, especially when you have a whole bunch of horses. If there's, like, five horses together, and there's a particular one that you're aiming for where you really want that color, or you have a good feeling about that one having good stats, then just shoot it with an ice arrow. All the other horses will be spooked. They'd run away. You just walk up to the frozen one and just keep mashing A until the ice thaws, and you immediately leap on, and it's great. So as long as the horse has high enough stats that it can handle the damage of the ice arrow, 
it's totally fine. And uh, those are the ones that are hard to sneak up on anyway, so it just kind of makes sense to go ahead and... I mean, I feel like it's a good use of an ice arrow. Like, yeah, they're expensive, kind of, but honestly, you go through quite a few fire arrows, and there's puzzles and stuff you use for them, but then ice arrows, other than fighting fire enemies, there isn't really a use for them. So, like, you end up with a surplus of... You steadily, like, gain ice arrows over the course of the game just from finding them in chests and stuff like that. Meanwhile, fire arrows you're using constantly and probably need to buy more. But yeah, I realize that's probably pretty unusual. I'm trying to think of, like, alternative tactics for the game in general, and uh, that's one of the things that I thought of. So I, I don't think that most people even consider that as an option, but yeah, super useful for taming horses. Just shoot them with an ice arrow. It's great. So once you have tamed the Royal Stallion, you want to work your way back towards the stable, and what'll happen along the way, too, is you'll notice it's being very disobedient and rearing its head and, like, not following your orders. And all you need to do is keep using the L button to soothe it, and this will cause it to be obedient again for a short little while. What this does is it increases its bond value, and once the bond is at 100%, you can then freely change the horse gear to whatever you want. Um, at this point, it doesn't really matter too much, but that is something important to realize, just that whenever you tame a new horse, you are going to have to increase its bond value before you can equip whatever horse gear you want. So just so you know, horses in Breath of the Wild are still technically considered wild until you register them at a stable. What this means is if you get off the horse and you save and load, or you teleport somewhere or whatever, then, or there's a blood moon, then this horse will disappear and it will go back to where its starting location was. In this case, that would be back at Safula Hill. So we want to register the horse so we can keep it forever forever and ever and ever. So you want to bring it to the stable master and cough up some rupees. Unfortunately, I don't currently have any rupees, so that's a problem. So how I solved this is I simply just sold some stuff to Beetle. He was right next to me. So Beetle's a shopkeeper who wanders around. He's always inside stables or just outside the stable or he's wandering on the road nearby. So if he's not here, just hop on your horse and then just run around the nearby roads and you'll find him right away. Yeah. You can sell stuff to him to get some rupees and that's all fine. By the way, cooked dishes always sell for more than the raw materials by themselves. So if you are going to sell stuff like that, it's better to cook it up first. Wow. Um, anyways, what would have been smarter actually is there's a nearby hidden chest just to my right. There is like four stumps and there's like a woodcutter's axe stuck in one of them. But right in between that, there's a metal chest you can pull up with Magnesis that has a silver rupee worth 100. And how I found that, by the way, is you can feed meat to the nearby dog and it leads you over to that chest. Now, as far as the things that he, you can sell to him, you can sell to him materials or cooked goods. Now, materials, just so you know, don't sell for as much. However, some things can't be cooked, such as uh, gems. So like the rubies and sapphires and opals and stuff that we got from the stone talus in the previous video, you can sell those to Beetle for a hefty amount of rupees, which is awesome. I'm actually hanging on to those for now because I will be using them to upgrade armor later, so I don't want to sell my gems just yet. Um, anyways, instead I'm going to sell him some uh, fish is what I sold him, but just so you know, um, cooked dishes sell for quite a bit more. It's way more valuable. So for example, if you have apples, if you cook three apples, they sell for uh, three rupees a piece is how much they sell for, but three of them um, they will sell for times three is nine rupees, but they also when you cook them They sell for 2.8 times the value and then round it up to the nearest 10 So in this case three times three times 2.8 equals 25.2 uh, it's rounded up to the nearest uh, 10 which is uh, 30 in this case So three apples will sell for 30 rupees Okay, I gotta stop talking about cooking. <laughs> cooking is like a, a black hole that you just get sucked into. There's just so much stuff to say about it. Um, anyways, so register your horse, cough up some rupees, and give your horse a name to finalize the process. Now you can name it whatever you want. I named mine Royal because I'm going to have several different horses and I wanted to be able to tell at a glance, like have distinguishing titles for them, because that's why. But it's not very exciting. If you have a funny name that you named your horse, feel free to share in the comments. Just please keep it PG, would be my request. But yeah, if you have an awesome name that's cool, then you can share with the group and then other people can use that name in their game and that'd be sweet. So next I'm gonna complete the Royal Stallion quest over with Taffa. And by the way, I think you can even just complete the quest immediately. Like you go straight to the horse and get it and then talk with him for the first time. And I think he's just like, what is that? Do you already have the horse? What is this? You know, uh, but anyway, so his dialogue is different if you did it in that order. Um, now the first time I played this game, I actually did not complete this quest because I thought he was going to take the horse away from me. Like I thought I was bringing him the horse. And then I just tried to register it just because I thought I'd try it and it worked and I was like, <gasps> like I'm not gonna talk to this guy because I don't want him to take my horse away from me I want to keep this one but I didn't realize he would just wanted to see the horse. Anyways, his reward for completing that quest is that he gives you the royal horse gear. And it's funnily enough, it actually switches out the gear automatically, even though normally you actually have to get a horse up to 100% bond before you can change your horse gear. This particular quest actually swaps out the gear just for this horse only. 
uh, the first time you talk with him and complete the quest. And as far as this horse gear goes, by the way, the stats are not any different than the default ones that you start out with just for registering your horse. The only thing different is just a cosmetic thing. It just looks different. Uh, but it's cool because Zelda in previous titles has had a white stallion with this particular horse gear. So with this combination, we look exactly like, we, you know, it looks exactly like the horses that Zelda has used in previous Zelda titles. So that's why it's cool. Um, as far as horses go, so the quest is totally optional, you can do it if you want to. As far as horses go, this is just a decent one. It's not amazing, but it's good overall stats. Slightly better than that, as well as easier, would be to just use the um, Link Smash amiibo. Would be a good one. That one immediately summons a Pona, who has slightly higher stats, and she doesn't. she's already at max bond and stuff like that, and you can just uh, register her immediately, and it's awesome. Of course, you can't even summon a Pona until we get the amiibo rune, so it's a little ways off. So I still think getting a horse early is important. So next, I'm pressing in on the right analog stick to use my scope and looking towards Satori Mountain. Just to the left of the peak, there are some little hills. You want to press A on one of those to place a pin. This is the location of a shrine that is up on top of the mountain, and that is our next destination. So even though we don't have a mini-map in the bottom right corner and everything's still all black, this still gives us something we can easily run towards. So by the way, for all these areas where you don't have the tower unlocked yet, this is a really easy way to get around. So generally speaking, I try to avoid using glitches in the game. I will mention this one. I don't really even use it very much for the walkthrough, but I do use it up ahead. This is a useful trick in Breath of the Wild, especially if it's raining a lot, is kind of in particular where I feel like, okay, it's okay to do this. <laughs> I actually did not have to struggle with too much rain in this walkthrough, so it's, so far it's been great, actually. So how this glitch works, it's called whistle running, and it allows you to run up hills, and I'm going to do it up here in a little bit, just because I got irritated, but um, I try not to do it very much for this walkthrough in general. So how it works is you place the control in your lap and then use your two index fingers so you have one on each analog stick. So you have one doing movement, one doing looking around for your camera, and then your left thumb is pressing down on the D-pad and your right thumb is pressing the B button. What this will do is it will constantly use the whistle uh, command to summon your horse, which what doesn't work when you're climbing something, and then the B button will constantly cancel climbing. You'll keep trying to grab on and climb, and then the B button will cancel it. What this will do is it will refresh your stamina, and it allows you to walk up mountains, as long as the, the incline isn't too steep. Uh, but what you'll find actually is that most mountains and cliffs and stuff in Breath of the Wild, there is some uh, like relative, like pretty steep areas but that aren't too steep, and you can just walk up them like pretty easily actually. So just by mashing the down on the D-pad and the B button over and over and over again, you can actually just kind of run up hills and it's, so it definitely looks stupid. It feels stupid. It also kind of sounds stupid, but yeah, seriously, it's like one of the most awkward like positions on the controller ever. So like it makes my hands cramp up, so I can't do it for very long. But anyways, just know that it is a thing for being able to climb up mountains and stuff like that. So there's a lot of hills, honestly, like most hills in the game, you'll be surprised how many of them you can actually just whistle run up instead of climbing like normal. Um, so if you want to use glitches and you don't mind doing that, then go for it. So here I'm using it to climb up this. So some, some inclines, if it starts getting too steep, then you, like for example, I could continue running off to the right and that would probably be fine. It's probably shallow enough or whatever. The grade isn't steep enough. So there's points where I have to climb. So I'm going to climb for this next little bit and then just run up this last little bit. Um, so I'm using this glitch once again just to climb this last little distance. Anyway, just know that I'm not really going to be whistle running a lot for this walkthrough at all. Um, my primary reason I'm bringing it up is because a lot of people use it and I know people are going to comment on it. And uh, But I will say like the most beneficial use of it, in my opinion, is two reasons. One is if you don't have a lot of stamina, like early game, like right now, because you don't use hardly any stamina at all when you whistle run. So it's very useful when you don't have enough stamina yet. And secondly, it's really useful when it's raining because you can't climb anyway. So if you are just, you're out in the middle of doing stuff and then all of a sudden you're like, ah, it starts raining, like, and you can't place a campfire, there's no good place to go, like, just, just whistle run, just get where you need to go, get it over with, you know, so that's why I'm bringing it up, um, and again, like I say, I'm trying to do this all game, this game pretty legit, I'm not using a lot of glitches, but I feel like that's a quality of life exception, you know, and I know what you're all thinking, like, why are we even here? <laughs> this is the opposite direction of Kakariko. Like, what is what is with this? But I do highly recommend you go to Satori Mountain first. And uh, there's a lot of things you can farm here, including flame blades, actually, which is very useful for changing the time of day. What this will do is it'll allow us to completely avoid rain entirely for the rest of the entire game. So it is a, it is a handy thing. So anyways, we're going to get a whole bunch of cool stamina food and stuff here. But in order to do so, we need a teleport point, such as the Moglaton Shrine. Latan? I don't, I don't know. Whatever you want to do there. 
All right, so wait for this platform to swing over and uh, then just jump onto it. Here I accidentally uh, walked forward before I pressed the jump button. It was fine, actually, because it was close enough and lower, so I actually did land on it, but kind of scary. <laughs> I don't think that you can use the uh, a Korok leaf here. I think you have to use Magnesis, but anyways, use it on this next platform that's not moving so that you can make it go back and forth. By the way, so when using Magnesis, you use forward or down and up on the D-pad to go forward and backwards. So move the platform either forward or backward and then get it to swing back and forth. Up ahead we have a bridge. You need to break the ropes that are holding it up using arrows to to do that. And this will allow us to get across. I mean, technically you could throw swords at it too would be another option. That's really hard to aim though. In this chest up ahead, we have a Forest Dweller Spear. This actually is pretty decent. Like you'll see my uh, Soldier Spear I have here is only 7 damage and this one's 11. That's a pretty decent one. Um, I would say this is kind of another one of those mid-low tier weapons. It's kind of similar quality range to like the Feathered Edge that I got. Um, so it's it's okay. Uh, but it is nice to have at least one wooden weapon on you. And I think the Spear option is actually a pretty decent one. So I'll probably hang on to this for a little bit. Up ahead, we have some giant metal spiky balls. I, is, is there a better name for these things? Like, is there some kind of official title? It's like the end of a flail. I don't understand. I don't know. Giant metal spiky balls. So move the giant metal spiky balls. My recommendation is actually to try and keep their chain relatively straight. So go past them. And once you're on the opposite side and the chain is still fairly straight, then you can release it. And that way it doesn't swing like uh, forward and backward towards you. So you don't take damage. And then just uh, don't do that uh, because that's a mistake. So our next objective is while standing near that chest that has the Forest Dweller's bow, by the way, you want to magnesis the nearby block that's on this like angled rail and then bring it over to the stairs. Next, sneak past that giant ball again, get on top of the stairs, get on top of the box, and you can't actually magnesis things that you're currently standing on. It doesn't actually work. However, doing so in this case, when you mess with it, it'll cause it to slide on the rail, which brings us over to our destination. So drag one of the other nearby metal boxes over this way, and then it, these ones are attached to the rail, so you can only move it along here. Again, to move things push and pull them, you want to use up and down on the D-pad, and this will allow you to bring it towards you. So next, just make a set of stairs all the way up to the top. That's actually all we had to do, but I do highly recommend you get this chest. I think a lot of people actually skip this one because they're like, eh, that's too much of a pain, I don't want to do it, but I highly recommend you do because it's awesome. What you want to do is stand on the second step and then move the first one over, and this allows you to easily make another set of stairs going the other direction. And somehow when I did this, it moved the second one over too. I don't really understand why. Also, as I was talking about earlier, you cannot mess with ones with Magnesis that you're currently standing on. It doesn't like it, so here it won't let me. However, I am close enough to go ahead and paraglide over to the chest, which has 300 rupees. That's awesome. <laughs> There's not actually all that many chests in the game that have 300 rupees, so it is pretty cool to be able to have this. So if you couldn't afford the horse registration fee, you certainly can now. Anyways, work your way back up and remember to drag the third one back closer a little bit to turn it into a set of stairs, and uh, don't do that, because that's bad. Unfortunately, by falling, I am losing hearts, and so I just decided to go ahead and heal up with some apples. I like using apples for just small amounts of healing. When I need something more substantial, that's when I actually eat a meal. So, like, I'll eat a meal to heal me most of the way, and then I'll use apples just to finish it off. Uh, so I just went ahead and used apples for this first part. Now, of course, apples will heal for double if you cook them first, just in general. So here what I did, too, is I moved this uh, second one back a little bit more. This is so that I had enough distance to jump to it. So I, Because what happened the last time is I bonked my head on top of the platform that was above me. So once you're done messing around and you make it up top, you want to smack the crystal switch and then use Magnesis on the metal lanterns to make them swing back and forth. Then you can shoot the rope to disconnect it and hopefully make it fall at the right time. I'm actually really shocked that I got this the first try. I usually miss on this. Now, an alternative for this is you can actually just, like, uh, light it with something else, whether that be a fire arrow or if you don't have access to that. You can also, the easiest way probably would be to, like, lay down a piece of wood and then stick a piece of flint next to it, smack the flint with a metal weapon to light the campfire, and then you can light the campfire on a regular arrow or a wooden weapon, and then just swing the wooden weapon at the leaves, which will set them on fire. So that would be a, a more complicated way to do that if you don't have any fire arrows. All right, so we now have a horse for fast traveling options. We can now warp to Satori Mountain to collect a bunch of goodies whenever we want, which I will be doing in the next video. As always, a huge thanks goes out to all of my Patreon supporters for helping to make this possible. And if you found this video helpful, be sure to throw a like on it and subscribe for more content just like this. Remember to stay awesome, you have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.